Hello, my fellow fallible humans. My name is Tanya McIntyre, and this is the Red Roof Recovery Show, a program to soften the path of recovery from substance and behavioral addictions. And it's not just for addictions, it's for life. I appreciate you spending the next few minutes here as I'm joined in conversation with my life partner, my best friend. I call him Sir Lancelot. My knight in shining armor has been with me for over 30 years. Much of that was lived experience through my drug and alcohol addictions. And he stuck with me. Lance a lot. Thank you. Lance brings perspective of a family member living with someone, not just through their addictions, but also living with someone in recovery. Uh, because, you know, my physical sobriety was just one step. Then my emotional sobriety is an ongoing journey for me. Lance shares his lived experience and empathy with family members whose loved ones are struggling with addictions. Effective communication tools can motivate your loved one to seek recovery sooner than later. We offer a thoughtful conversation here about a variety of recovery topics. You're going to be hearing science-based approaches to build a life beyond addiction, a life that you will not need to escape from because there are literally hundreds of tools that you can use to manage recovery in life. The key one of my favorite acronyms, key, keep educating yourself until you find something that clicks for you. This is about you and your recovery. I'm sharing with you what has worked for me in my recovery, and I hope it inspires and motivates you or someone you love. On this episode of the Red Roof Recovery Show, we're talking about great expectations, setting yourself up for success in recovery. So Lance, you had uh, something to say about this earlier, which gave us the idea for the podcast topic. Yes, um, I think um, through my experience of watching you go through your phases and other people during our work, there's an expectation that when you make the decision to uh, go into a facility to aid your recovery that once you've done your in our case one week or your 30 days 45 days 60 days 90 days 120 days that you're going to come out at the end of it cured now that's a very interesting word to use in recovery i think cure because mm. i think we both feel that there's no such thing as a cure for addictive behaviors. I agree. Um, and you know, when my rehab experience happened in 2009, the only model of recovery available then was the 12 step recovery of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I often say AA saved my life and something called SMART, self-management and recovery training, gave me my life back because when I was in AA 12 step meetings, AA and NA for eight years, I kept relapsing every year, but that was not the fault of the program. I think that was the fault of my um, expectations that by going into a 30 day rehab, I was going to come out and not have to do anything to maintain my sobriety. I thought I would be cured. I was kind of expecting that, I would one day be able to have a glass of wine with dinner or, you know, have that snifter of brandy after a nice meal. You know, those romantic re recollections that I wasn't ready to give up. So I think yeah. for sure there was definitely an expectation of a cure that I wouldn't really have to do a lot to maintain my abstinence from drug and alcohol. So this is one, as I say, as someone who is just an observer and doesn't really understand what people go through when they're, they're battling, trying to get out of their, their addictive behaviors is that there's this expectation that there's gonna, they're gonna go to, once they've made the decision that they, they need help and they reach out and they set everything in place and they go into, that there's gonna be this epiphany that it's a bit like, a you know, you're, you're going to go in, you're going to take your driving lessons and you're going to pass your test at the end of it and then you're going to go out and you're going to be a perfect driver. You can do anything you like. And as we know, with driving, once you pass your test, that's when you start to learn to drive. 
and it takes work. But it seems to me that a lot of people don't expect that when they when they emerge from the facility they have chosen, that there's work afterwards. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. There is an expectation around that for sure. I do see an evolution since my first rehab experience, though, that the industry seems to have, um, you know, finally developed that idea that it's going to take more than just a recovery residential stay uh, for you to be on the right path to kind of set that infrastructure that you need, that foundation that you need. Uh, you know, I always use the analogy of um, a treating your mind like a garden um, that, you know, you're creating this path of recovery that you want to keep as free of bumps as possible. So uh, creating this smooth walk of recovery, a smooth path of recovery that you do that by sowing good seeds and doing regular weeding, right? Treating your mind like a garden. Your garden is the mind that you are retraining to serve you in healthier ways. And we do that by sowing good seeds, by hanging around with good people, um, staying in good places, doing good things, people, places, and things, that we have to keep those as positive and aligned with our recovery as possible. And then the, the uh, weeding is to avoid the, the people, places, and things that are going to take you toward your addictions. So I use that and analogy, metaphor, whatever it is of treating your mind like a garden. So you are sowing and seeding this path of recovery. So you have a smoother walk because that's what it is. It's a path. It's a journey. Well, I, I understand that. But you and as you say, the the uh, the industry is evolving. It is with aftercare, because when I yeah. left, I'm sorry that I tend to go down these rabbit holes and not finish the thought. So, um, yes, when I left my 30 day rehab experience, there was no aftercare program. You were basically told to go to 30 meetings in 30 days when you get out. And that was supposed to be the the aftercare, the end all be all. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot to be said for meetings. You know, I love the peer support of 12 step meetings. If you can find good meetings, they're absolutely, uh, I think, an integral part of recovery. They can be. Uh, for me, the relapsing happened when I got to step four. Uh, and that's quite common because step four in 12 step programs is that you have to do a, a fearless and searching moral inventory. <laughs> Who wants to do that? <laughs> run away, run away. <laughs> so uh, that was my stickling point uh, for many, many years is trying to get through the fourth and fifth steps of 12 step programs. I kept relapsing because I didn't want to face it. So when I was introduced to SMART, self-management and recovery training in 2018, and cognitive therapies resonated with me. That's why I'm, I'm so passionate about uh, keep educating yourself. The key for me has, to, has been to keep looking, keep educating myself. I kept relapsing in 12-step programs. After eight years, I was going to a lot of funerals, and I knew it was just going to be a matter of time before I didn't return from one of my relapses, and I went in search of a solution, something secular that I could bring to my community, and the pickings were slim when I was looking in 2018. Uh, a couple of things came on the radar for me, SMART, uh, and that was in Mentor, Ohio, which is part of the reason why I chose SMART. The other one was Life Ring, and I'm, I'm involved with Life Ring as well. It's, uh, it had its founding in the early 2000s in Florida, and it made its way to British Columbia and Alberta. It seems to be very popular in the West Coast of Canada and in parts of the United States now. Um, but where we are in Ontario, it's taking a little longer to get here. So I am now a convener, a meeting convener with Life Ring as well. I believe that cognitive therapies can work. They don't work for everybody. They worked for me because it forced me to do the work that I was avoiding in 12-step programs. It forced me to ask the questions, what do you want? What are you doing about it? And how do you feel about what you're doing about it? That was a well, question that I never took time to really. Well, this is my, my question because obviously you'd been, you went into, re you made a decision in 2009 to go into rehab 
thinking that that was the be all and end all and you'd come out and that thing would be fine and relapsed and then went on the cycle of relapse and finally found what was working for you. Now, we've established that the industry is is evolving. Yes. Are the people, are the clients, are the participants within that who, who seek help, are they evolving as well? Well, in my experience, I mean, I've been now, I've managed to sustain my abstinence from drugs and alcohol for over four years now, and that's thanks to immersing myself in the work. I think when you stay engaged in the work of your recovery, because like I said, the physical re uh, part of my recovery was just the first step, uh, stopping the drugs and alcohol was just step one. And then I had to work on my emotional sobriety. And that's ongoing, as you know, living with me. You've, you've now uh, been with me abstinent from drugs and alcohol for over four years. And you know the challenges that you have living with me in my emotional sobriety and how, yes. how important it is for me to continue the work on that. And I think this is why I wanted to do this episode because my observations are with people who have made the decision to seek help is the expectation is that once they have finished their time in in the facility that they are they're good they're cured. So. well they're i get that so. question a lot lance actually people say you know when i finish your program will i be cured and that's a tough one because it depends on what cure means for you. I feel cured because, you know, this has been a long journey. This mine started in 2009 and I've got lots of evidence about what doesn't work for me because I, I had a lot of relapses in my background. And now that I have enjoyed over four years of continual sobriety, I'm confident that yes, I can say, yes, I'm recovered. I've experienced a cure. That's not to say that I can get complacent with the work that I'm doing. I stay very engaged in my aftercare, my relapse prevention work. And I, I mean, it's a business for me now, too. So it's a little easier for me to stay engaged in it. But for people expecting that they can come out of a, a rehab facility and not do anything except not drink, drug, whatever your addiction is, uh, without staying engaged in something, like I say, it doesn't take long. It takes a persistent willingness to exert consistent efforts to help yourself. It can take, for me, it's like 10, 15 minutes a day of doing something specific for my self-care, something specifically related to my recovery. And it keeps my path uh, a lot smoother, for sure. Mm -hmm. But everybody's different. Well, yeah. I, I What I've observed is a lot of people think that when they're cured at some point in the future they'll be able to drink or do whatever moderately oh the dream of moderation yes there are a lot of programs that promise moderation i have never seen anybody successfully moderate an addiction i would love to hear from somebody if you have i will talk to you about that um, there are lots of programs that promise an ability to moderate i have yet yeah. to see it successful yeah and nor have I with my limited limited observation of things. But, you know, that, that is one of the expectations that, one, that once you've done your your course of your program, that you're going to come out and everything's going to be fine and you don't have to do anything else. And two, that sometime in the future, after you've been abstinent for X amount of time, you'll be able to become a social drinker or, whatever and like you i've never seen it work what does work is the elements that you can take into your recovery journey you decide that you're going to change and stay abstinent from your addiction then you make a plan very important and then act decide plan and act and the actions are taking you toward where you say you want to be so the plan is setting the goal so you decide that you're going to make the change, you plan for it, you set the goal, and then you act. All your actions stay aligned with the path that you're on. And again, that treating your mind like a garden, sowing good seeds, and doing regular weeding. 
uh, that seems to be the hard work for me is just to keep treating my mind like a garden and talking to myself like I talk to my good friends. Very good. Thank you, sweetheart. I love your perspective uh, from, from being a family member, living through my addictions and now living with me through my recovery. I appreciate you. Mwah. Thank you. I love you. And I appreciate you for listening and watching wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much. And if you get something from our conversations, please uh, send us a like and a subscription and a share with your friends. It means the world to us. You can sign up for recovery tips and tools on our website, redroofrecovery.com. May the force be with you, and remember, you are the force.